I'm always amazed by the humility of those who serve God by demonstrating the gospel and how they live each day. One in our church family said last week, I'm not a preacher, but I'm so grateful for the opportunity to live for Christ. This from a lifelong missionary, and we have a few in this church. The pulpit ministry and pastoral work is an awesome opportunity to share the news. But those who get up each day and serve God in their home, their workplace, their clubs, those who help others in the many services from teaching to sales, to nursing, to custodial work, caring for family at home, homeschooling, can have the greatest platforms for telling others about the gospel, sharing the gospel. They watch you. Whatever you're doing in your day, those who have come to faith have commented about believers they have watched. They are different. Why are they different? Why do they act differently when I do, different than I do when I was treated in that way? This is evangelism. This is the Great Commission. Some jabs might come your way, some ridicule. This isn't fun. But I find that those making the jabs are usually the ones who are searching in a big way, often fighting the call on their hearts. So be encouraged, because so often the toughest fights end with incredible results. Humble church, you are all evangelists and servants of the Lord. You are powerful ambassadors, and we learn so much from each other. I've heard so many stories of triumph in the worst of circumstances because that individual is committed to the Lord in all that they do. Whatever they are doing, the changes in life, the rhythms of life, being a follower of Christ, people are watching and often they want what you have. This is why loving your church and being connected is so vital. It helps to keep you filled uplifted, prepared, rejuvenated, and even healed emotionally and sometimes physically for the incredible responsibility we all have to share that gospel. Jesus has given us new lives without fences. Lives that are part of the new community he is creating. Life in this community, in his kingdom, is life as it was meant to be, giving us a new identity and a new set of values and ethics to live by. From last week, we understood our reputation as people of this new community should be one of love. God wants all people to know this life of salvation, forgiveness, peace, healing, purpose, and hope. Loving the church impacts the community for the gospel, bringing us to Matthew 5 this morning. Love Matthew 5. We've discussed salt before. As with all scripture, Jesus often provides us a different application or context in his parables. The last time we discussed salt, I provided some history of how it was used today. The many applications since we are looking at salt as Jesus wanted us to, how it affects us in community, I'm going a different way. Have we lost our saltiness in our spiritual life, our zest for Christ? It's important for us to look at this passage within the lens of the day Jesus taught it. The seemingly simplest of parables can cause us to go deep as there's some interesting mysteries to the idea of salt that we didn't cover the first time. To this day, people use salt of the earth to describe good, honest, humble people. For example, Sherry is the salt of the earth. Mike is the salt of the earth. That family is the salt of the earth. We hear that quite often. 
But here are some things to ponder as the disciples had extra insight into salt, especially in their time. Jesus says, you are, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. And with some help from my research at the Gospel Coalition and Andrew Wilson, let's take salt a little further. We all know the first use of salt. And the disciples would have known that as well. But they keyed into much more. Salt is used, as we all know, for flavoring. Salt makes food taste better, either by adding flavor to something that would otherwise be blah, like chips or fries. I can't have chips without salt. But by enhancing flavors that are already there, vegetables, if you're eating vegetables with salt, shame on you, or by providing a contrast with a very different sort of taste, like salted caramel, salted caramel. And I say, thank the Lord for my gift card so I can have caramel macchiatos on a Sunday morning. <laughs> I still get those. Salted caramel, very good. So flavoring is probably the use of salt that most of us think of because it's the one of five that still applies today. One of five. So the second is preserving. Salt equaled our modern day refrigeration in Old Testament and New Testament times. Rubbing salt on fish or meat delayed decay. This was the main reason salt was so valuable. We mentioned this before. Roman soldiers were sometimes paid in salt, the origin of the word salary. And I appreciate this analogy. Disciples of Jesus, in this sense, are sent into the world to keep it from decay preserving its goodness and preventing it from becoming corrupted or ruined. I like that. And number three, and this is thought provoking because we don't do sacrifices, not that I know of. Salt was used for sacrificing. This may well be related to the previous two functions of salt, although it's probably less familiar to us. Early in Israel's history, Moses explained how Israel was to offer sacrifices to the Lord. You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Leviticus, amazing. And perhaps because it's flavored food and kept meat from going bad, salt was a necessary part of all of the Israelite sacrifices and even represented God's covenant with them. And a thoughtful quote in all of this, salt does, does not just savor, it saves. Does not just savor, it saves. So number four is destroying. We often don't think of destroying with salt, but yes, destroying has been part of the salt issue. We can't escape it. There are many scriptural references to salt being used in judgment, destruction, more than, for, more than any other purpose. It was used for that. When Lot's wife turns back to look at the city of Sodom, she is turned into a pillar of salt. A story Jesus refers to when describing the day of his coming. Moses also warns the Israelites that if they break God's covenant, their land will be burned out with brimstone, brimstone and salt. Nothing sown and nothing growing where no plant can sprout. When Gideon's son Abimelech tries to set himself up as king of Israel, the men of Shechem rebel against him, and he responds by raising the city and sowing it with salt. The psalmist describes God turning a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. Jesus himself, in one of the fiercest judgment paragraphs in the gospel, says, simply, Everyone will be salted with fire. Mark 9, interesting reference. What we need to remember when considering salt in this context, in the ancient Near East, it was used to express judgment upon evil. So number five, our last, in my big one, I like this one the best, fertilizing. Several ancient civilizations used salt as a fertilizer for the soil. And depending on the conditions, it could help the earth retain water, make fields easier to plow, 
release minerals for plants, kill weeds, protect, protect crops from disease, stimulate growth, and increase yields. When we consider salt and our topic of loving our church through service, Jesus specifically describes his people as the salt of the earth, which in a rural farming culture would have been incredibly significant for our New Testament disciples. Absolutely. And we can use that today without any doubt. And I love this analogy. Disciples are fertilizers. We're meant to be in those places where conditions are challenging and life is hard. We are sent to enrich the soil, kill the weeds, protect against disease, and stimulate growth. And as we scatter, life springs up in unexpected places. Barren lands become fruitful. When the people of God are redeemed, as the prophet says, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. Good old Isaiah. To serve the church we love, we must listen to the words of Jesus. So when Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth, what did he mean? Did he mean, did he mean that God will use us for flavoring, preserving, sacrificing, destroying, or fertilizing? To be most honest, consider each one with the, within the context, context of then and now. And it's okay to analyze the many explanations. And remember, just add a pinch of salt to all of it. So in this passage that um, was read this morning, we focus a great deal on salt. But it's both salt and light. As salt and light, we bring the taste and atmosphere of Jesus's kingdom into our world. And we discussed the restaurant and the dentist last week. And let's take the dentist off the plate. Pun well intended. A, co a commentator from Sermon Central states, if food plus atmosphere equals experience, then the experience of the kingdom comes from his followers. I can say that again. If food plus atmosphere equals experience, then the experience of the kingdom comes from his followers. So let's not miss the metaphor of light in this passage, because we always seem to go to the salt. Light removes the darkness. We not only carry the light of the gospel of the kingdom of God, but we are that light. Because of the work of the spirit in our lives, our transformation has produced kingdom light in us affecting every aspect of our being. This in turn creates a serving atmosphere within our church community that we take into the world. And we live this light out in our daily lives. It amazes me to think of what God entrusts his church with. The father trusted people to cultivate his creation to manage it and take care of it. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The them is us. And now when he establishes his kingdom, Jesus entrusts us to curate his culture. We are to bring the taste. We are to bring the light. We are to bring the Jesus community kingdom experience to our city so that they can know God and find him. Repent and find new life. Think about it like this. If we don't like how our city is, ask yourself if you're salting it. Discouraged that our culture is too dark? Ask yourself if you're lighting it up. If the culture is bland and dark, then we need to work at salting and lighting. And the best part, when we intentionally love one another, when we intentionally use our gifting and live out the love of God towards one another and to the world outside these walls, 
We are salting the bland and bringing light into the darkness. Saying, I love my church, isn't just about us. It doesn't just impact us. It's about everyone outside these walls as well. Loving our church involves serving community. No matter your status in life, your position, your education, remember how effective you are when you remain salty and full of light. You are a walking pulpit. You are a walking Bible study. You are a living prayer warrior. Don't give up the fight. Don't give in to the mocking or frustration. Just keep loving Jesus and walking in his ways. When you love Jesus, you love your church. Simple words. But you carry around superpowers through his Holy Spirit. Hold on to that. Jeff Clark reminds us, the gathered community of the church is a fellowship of people called and enabled by God through Christ, by the Spirit, to actively identify and participate together in God's kingdom dream to and for the world. Jesus came to inaugurate and build his kingdom, and the church lies at the center of this work He did not come to establish a new private faith that separates people from one another, but a new community, Jew and Gentile, called together for the sake of the world, showcasing to the world what will become a fellowship of a very different people. May we go out this week and continue building God's church by serving others in our everyday, just as Jesus intended. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus called us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Give us the strength and wisdom to become the people of the Beatitudes in our day so that our words may season the world with the flavor of the gospel and our lives be shining examples of Jesus, who is the true light of the world. And we ask this in his precious name. Amen.